Therefore, it's time for member statements. The member from the PM Carleton. Thank you very much. Speaker, it's a pleasure to rise in the Assembly today to talk about the opiate crisis that has hit Ottawa and in specific uh, the community of Canada. Over the weekend, I met with uh, community leader Sean O'Leary, whose uh, own daughter is struggling with addiction. I also met with Kevin Neal, whose daughter as well is struggling with an opiate addiction. And yesterday, they brought together a dozen parents, one of whom lost their child to a fentanyl overdose in October, and three teenagers who are addicted to these horrible, potentially fatal drugs. And one of the girls impacted me so much, Speaker, when she told me that she was just 10 years old when she started doing drugs and that she became addicted to uh, fake or counterfeit Percocets that are laced with fentanyl. Speaker, more needs to be done. There is no question about it. That's why I reached out today to the Premier of Ontario, asking her to put forward uh, a, a task force of a number of different ministries, including health, uh, education, children and youth, correction and community service, uh, and the uh, the. the um, the college's university and training uh, organization because I think it's time that we started talking about what can be done very quickly and what can be done in the longer term to save these kids. This is a deadly, deadly pill that is out there, and it's something we've never seen in this province before uh, with respect to the chemicals that are in it, and I think more needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stavis, the member from Parkdale Hay Park. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm sure that most folk in the House are aware of the uh, President Trump's executive order that rescinded trans rights to students across the United States. Uh, this in itself will result in the deaths of trans students, make no mistake. We're also or should be aware that Bill C-16, which extends uh, gender identity and uh, gender expression rights to trans uh, folk across Canada for federal institutions and federal employment, languishes as we speak in the Senate. Um, I'm particularly proud that five years ago, this House passed gender identity and gender expression human rights into the Ontario Human Rights Code called Toby's Act. Um, and I wanted to set the record straight because there's a great deal of confusion in the trans community about whether they're covered or not. You are covered in employment, in health care, in housing, in education. You are covered in Ontario. And remember, it wasn't about water fountains, and it's not now about washrooms. Human rights are human rights. And Ontario trans folks, thank you, thanks to everyone in this House, have those rights. Thank you. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Speaker, by unanimously supporting a private member's bill affirming that Ontario stands against prejudice and for the best of every community, this legislature showed the province, the country, and the rest of the world that Ontario can rise above the partisan rancor seen elsewhere when discussing who does and who should live amongst us. Ontario drew a line against dark nativist anger. The City of Mississauga passed a similar motion in City Council last week. Canada's Parliament will likely also pass such a motion as well. At Solel Congregation last weekend, our only uh, synagogue in Mississauga, new Rabbi Audrey Pollock, herself an immigrant from Illinois, hosted members of Mississauga's Jewish community and representatives of every major religion practiced in Mississauga, particularly our Muslim community. Along with our mayor and council members, the congregation affirmed that Ontario is a place for everyone to feel safe and secure and to build a life, a family, a home, and a career. Our Muslim community has donated more than $250,000 to build Credit Valley Hospital. Its annual walkathon will raise more funds to improve health care in Mississauga. This is how Ontarians come together to affirm the dignity of those who call our province home and lay the path to a prosperous and a harmonious future. Thank you, Speaker. Sure, sure. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Niagara West Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a great honour to be able to stand today and represent the fine uh, citizens of Niagara West Glanbrook and my constituents there, in particular the community of Grimsby. I rise today to speak about Grimsby Rotary at Noon, which is an excellent organization that does great work in my community. On the 11th of February earlier this month, I had the opportunity to attend the Mayor of Grimsby's gala, where 
they hosted a fundraiser in support of Habitat for Humanity and hosted and were able to come up with funds for a third Habitat for Humanity build in Grimsby. Mr. Speaker, the, Rotary's, the Rotary at Noon Club is behind many local initiatives in the Grimsby community. Literacy programs, fundraising dances, breakfast clubs in local school, schools, the Mayor's Gala and Grimsby's second and the humanity, uh, Habitat for Humanity, and I'm proud to be able to stand and congratulate them for the great work they do. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Enough is enough. Junk driving. Mr. Speaker, it's with a heavy heart that I tell my colleagues in this House that a young woman from my riding was killed Friday night when she was hit by a drunk driver. She was only in her early 20s. Her friends and her co-workers describe her as a thoughtful and caring person who always helped others. In fact, just recently, she had gone away with her church to help those less fortunate in Central America. This bright young girl was out on a Friday night like so many young people when her life was taken from her by someone decided to drink and get behind the wheel. When will this come to an end? What do we have to do to finally see the end of drunk driving in the province of Ontario? The other day, a story broke in Niagara Falls of a man who'd been convicted 11 times for drunk driving. No one in the province of Ontario should be driving after you've convicted a drunk driving 11 times. I can talk about my family real quick. My wife, was hit by a drunk driver and she's coming home from school as a vice principal. And I talked to her this morning. She can't take long walks. She can't dance for any length of time. She was a good athlete. She used to play golf, volleyball, and squash. It takes its toll on families. My daughter, her Jacqueline, and Rita's parents, who saw their daughter go through that and be in a hospital for three months. The conclusion, we have to work together and end this. When it's to educate people on ensuring the punishment fits the crime. Whatever it takes, we cannot lose one more daughter or mother or aunt or father or son or anyone to drunk driving. Please drive sober. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand today in the House to celebrate the work of a wonderful organization in my writing that great, greatly benefits Inuit, First Nations, and Indigenous communities. These are communities that need services, and this organization is there for their. There are a number of centers and family services organization Indigenous people, whether it's in health care, in housing, legal services, or training. These organizations engage in a multitude of initiatives to promote community building through education and advocacy. They take care of the needs for the very young to the seniors, and they take into consideration the deep trauma that have been experienced by people who have suffered the long-lasting effects of residential schools. So I want to salute today the way in which this holistic approach is used that grounded in Indigenous values is used to help the healing and the reconciliation aspect in my riding. I want to salute their work today and offer them all my support. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are very blessed in Ontario to have brave and capable first resp responders across our province who go to work each day not knowing what challenges or circumstances they may face. We can't possibly thank them enough for their service and sacrifice. Today, I would like to recognize two Strathroy Caradoc police officers who acted quickly and saved the life of a local man. On December 15, 2016, a call came that a man had been found unresponsive. Police and ambulance were dispatched. Constable Paul Westendorp was the first to arrive on scene. He administered CPR and used a defibrillator. Constable Pat Weidenberg arrived shortly after and assisted with CPR. Because of this intervention, Mr. Edward Hodgetts was revived and taken to the Strathroy Middlesex General Hospital. The actions taken by these two officers were responsible for saving Mr. Hodgetts' life. Interviewed by the local people, 
or by the local paper, Constable Westendorp was very humble, saying the incident reminded him why he got into policing and that it was a great feeling to be part of the chain of care. I want to thank these officers for their service to our community. Their actions on December 15th are a fine reminder of the example of dedicated service of first responders across the province. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Etobicoke Centre. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And Speaker, today I rise to say thank you to a group of people and organizations that are making a difference in my community in Etobicoke Centre every single day. Every day as MPPs, we hear from our constituents who need our help. Sometimes our staff can assist them, but very often we actually connect them with government agencies or community agencies that can offer the support that, they, that our constituents need. Community agencies are often run and funded by volunteers, and they provide assistance daily to our constituents, including my own, and they are fundamental to the quality of life of all our ridings and to my riding of Etobicoke Centre. And although these organizations offer a lot of useful services, many constituents are actually often unaware of them and therefore can't always access the help that they need when they need it. We can all think of instances when constituents in our respective communities have reached out to our constituency office to ask us for help and assistance in finding local organizations or elements of the government that can actually serve their specific needs and solve their problems. That is why, a couple of weeks ago, I, alongside my colleague from Etobicoke Lakeshore, Peter Milchin, organized the annual Government and Community Services Fair at Cloverdale Mall in Etobicoke, and I'm proud to say we were joined by Laura Albanese, our Minister for Citizenship and Immigration. The fair created a space for 113 exhibitors consisting of community service organizations and government agencies, and we managed to attract over 3,000 people, and the fair allowed my constituents to learn more about these wonderful organizations and what they do. So I rise today, Speaker, to thank the 113 exhibitors, not only for participating in the fair, but for dedicating themselves to serving my constituents, for making our community a better place to live, and for making a difference in Etobicoke Centre every single day. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for the member seven. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in the House today to re recognize world champions in my riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka. Bracebridge's own Laurel Taransky, a retired teacher from Port Sydney, and her team of Siberian Huskies won the Six Dog Northern Breed category of the Winter Sled Dog World Championships in Halliburton last month. Laurel and her team beat out competitors from around the globe in the eight-mile race. She overcame adversity in many ways to win the title. Twelve years ago, Laurel qualified for the World Cup, but she was unable to compete when she received a breast cancer diagnosis. This year, as a cancer survivor, Laurel competed without taking medication for the arthritis in her back in order to avoid testing positive in the random drug testing. Another challenge in the lead-up to the competition was training in the freezing rain that affected the Muskoka Trails for much of January. Despite the slippery conditions, training in Algonquin Park gave her team an edge as the hills mimicked much of the Halliburton terrain. I have no doubt that Laurel's strategic training plan helped propel her team to their first place finish. I would like to congratulate Laurel and her dogs on their impressive achievement and also for her great tenacity and strength. Congratulations, Laurel. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's now